Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bo and Luke Show. Before we get started this week, I want to talk about something very serious, and that is the new gear that's going to be available at theboandlukeshow.com. I'm talking about trucker hats, gator covers, face masks, possibly beer koozies. We will be taking suggestions on gear that you might want. Now close your eyes for a minute and imagine yourself walking into a room and how revered you will be when they see you donning your Bowen Luke show face mask, showing that not only do you care about personal and professional development, you care about the safety of others as well. Please go on there and check it out. Uh, we're really excited to provide this to you. You can see videos of Bo and I wearing it when we do some of the podcasts as well. And, you know, without further ado, let's, we have a really good show here for you today. Uh, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm, I'm your co-host, Luke Kerrigan, and I'm sitting here virtually with uh, the other co-host, Bo Bravo. And today, folks, uh, you're going to hear uh, an incredible individual. His name's Marlon Kerner. Marlon is the Director of Player Engagement and Alumni at the Buffalo Bills, our NFL team in the Northeast where it's cold and there's a lot of snow. Uh, previously, Marlon was a third-round draft pick for the Bills. He played several, several seasons as a starting cornerback. Uh, this guy's got what it takes to play at the elite levels, uh, not only in football and in the game, but on the executive level. Um, he was an executive for Target for several years. Marlon has really, really done a lot in his life, and he brings it here to the Bo and Luke Show for all of you to, to listen to, to emulate, to take tools and tips and tactics. You can learn from Marlon a lot. Uh, so stay tuned, listen in, make sure you check out theboneluckshow.com for giving us feedback. If you want to be a guest, hit the guest request form. Uh, we're starting to get uh, lots of people signed up for our email subscription list, so be on the lookout for some newsletters coming out and some postings, keep you up to date on new things that are happening with the Bo and Luke show. Uh, we greatly appreciate you signing up and listening in. Check us out on Instagram uh, at the Bo and Luke show, LinkedIn, YouTube. Luke, we're in about every social media platform there is. Um, we're not in TikTok yet. No, probably a good thing though. That's, that's about to be banned. I hear. Yeah. 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 Maybe we'd be huge in China banned or bought by some u.s company <laughs> one of the, or the other one of one them. of the bees yeah and hey if you haven't noticed luke's got a brand new introduction voice i love it we always change things up here on the on the bone luke show so his new subdued subtle introduction brings you into the show nice and cool just like this and it makes you want to listen here we go yeah. let's do this <laughs> So Marlon Kerner, tell us, start us out with, uh, with who you are, where you're from, where you grew up, uh, a little bit about yourself. It's like your, your three minute elevator pitch, if you will. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Marlon and I am originally from Columbus, Ohio, uh, born and raised there, uh, ended up playing football at the Ohio State University, uh, and am currently married, um, and have three kids, um, Three teenagers. Uh, so one will wow. turn 19 next week. One is 17 and one is 15. So very busy uh, in, in the dad household and, and trying to have some interesting conversations with teenagers and also, you know, pick up at yourself, clean about yourself, you know, the fun dad yeah, stuff yeah. that always goes along with that. So, um, so that's me. Um, love football. I've um, been loving football probably since I was four years old when I knocked out my two front teeth on my fourth birthday. Uh, oh. Long, long story. The quick version of the story is my mom, one of my brother, um, I'm also a twin. Um, so my oh. twin brother and I had to wear the same outfits on our birthday. Um, and I wanted to play football with my friends. Uh, and my mom said I had to wear this outfit with the dress shoes. Uh, I argued to no avail and went out and played football anyway and made a cut full speed in dress shoes. And you can't cut in dress <laughs> shoes and grass. Uh, so <laughs> I went face first <laughs> into the sidewalk. <laughs> Uh, and knocked out those two front teeth and did not get any ice cream and cake on that birthday either. I, oh I was laying on the couch with, with an ice pack, just crying all day. Um, but, you know, that was my love affair of football. Um, I, I, I've been loving it and been around it um, for a long time since then. Amazing. That's super cool. So how, how did you end up at uh, – I got to show you this first. How did you end up at um, <laughs> Ohio State? 
Why Ohio? I mean, what? Obviously, you're from there, so that's probably a big decision. You, you grew up in Columbus. That was a big decision. Um, growing up in Columbus, um, believe it or not, I was a Notre Dame fan. I huh. I was a high school quarterback, um, and I did get that letter from Michigan and quickly looked at it and tossed it, um, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then had it narrowed down to Ohio State and Notre Dame. Um, and huh. being a high school quarterback, um, Ohio State like really tall quarterbacks, six five guys. Notre Dame had Tony Rice when I was coming out of high school. Um, uh-huh. So I was like, you know, I can run an option. Um, and I was, I was all set, ready to go to Notre Dame. And the recruiting wars that, you know, happen when you're trying to figure out how you can get your talent there. Right. Uh, Notre Dame took too long. And Ohio State was always there. It was kind of like, for me, 1A, 1B. It didn't really matter. I knew they were both really good programs, yeah. just, just a chance to get away. Um, and then my mom got married when I was 18. Um, so I was, I was graduating high school. My mom got married and my, and, and, th- and my stepdad was going to be in the Air Force. Uh, uh-huh. So once Ohio State really committed and said, hey, we want, we want you here. And my mom said, hey, you know, I'm getting married um, June 22nd. I think I graduated like June 9th. Uh, and then they were off to Germany. So it made it very easy oh, for wow. me to decide. To say, I'm, I'm staying here. I don't need to go too far. I can be near any other friends and other family because my mom is going to be halfway across the world yeah. uh, in, a, in another time zone. So it made it easier to say Ohio State it is. Amazing. That's a great story. Phenomenal story. Yeah. See, my brother didn't like that because we both had um, a scholarship to go to Ohio State and he decided to go with mom. And I tried to talk him into it. I was like, please stay with me. Like, you got a full ride to Ohio State. Come stay with me. And he went with mom and Uh he came back and he's doing well for himself. But we always joke about, man, we could have been roommates in college. Like, you know how much stuff we could have got into just hanging out together? Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) Especially as twins. Are you identical twins, I take it? We are. I am um, fraternal twins. twins. I'm seven minutes older. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, you could have had a great time. Yes. You'll just yeah, have to imagine well those times. Him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. So, never too late. yeah, no, it's never too late. You can always get in trouble with your brother. That's for sure. <laughs> um, so you played high school. You were a quarterback. Did you play quarterback at Ohio State or did you, you went to a different position? I made the switch to cornerback at Ohio ah. State. I, I, remember, I remember the day that I said I'll probably play cornerback at Ohio State was a day when I was at their football camp um, and I was doing all the quarterback drills and they, mm-hmm. they make you run a 40, right? They want to see how fast you can run. And so they had all the position groups run their, their drills and run their 40s and the QBs came up and ran and, and I got down and I had really never ran like the track style and everything. They say, get down to your track. So like, okay, what, you want me to do a three-point stance? And he yeah. said, yeah, that's fine. So I get down in a three-point stance like a big fullback um, at 5'10", 165 pounds. Um, of hulking muscle that I was back then in, 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 as a senior in high school. And I get down on a three-point stance, and I run, and I come back, and I said, well, what did I run? He's like, uh, you ran a 4-4 flat. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And he's like, you got to do it again. I'm like, all right. So I, I said, same stance, three-point stance uh-huh. again? Sure. I get back down, and I same thing, and I run again, and I run a 4-4 flat again. And so he said, okay, you can go back, and we're doing our quarterback drills, and I'm just uh-huh. – we're, we're, we're on one knee, and I'm just doing like this, just tossing the ball, getting the arm loosened up. Uh-huh. And the uh, defensive back coach came over and said, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And I'm like, sure. And he's like, have you ever played corner before? And I was like, yes, I have. I played it, um, you know, JV style, nothing on the varsity level yet. And he mm-hmm. said, um, why don't you walk up here and talk with me for a little bit? And we talked. And he said, what do you think about covering that guy? And I was like, yeah, I can cover him. He said, okay, well, why don't you go do that? And I said, <laughs> where do you want me to stand? <laughs> he, said, he said, about seven yards. I'm like, okay, so about right here? And he said, yes. And so we did this for about 15 minutes. And I broke up balls and people tried to run deep on me and they couldn't do it. Uh-huh. And I really didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just out there just playing football. Yeah. And he said, he, after that, he said, okay, I think, I think we're good. He said, would it be okay if I recruited you as a cornerback? I think you can play this, um, play corner at the next level. And mm-hmm. I'm like, sure, absolutely. So I started getting a letter every week from Ohio State from that point on just saying, hey, we really want you. We think you can play, you know, come here. Uh, and so as the recruiting game played out, it just became more apparent that Ohio State really, really wanted me to come there and wanted to, and I, I wanted to yeah. be where I felt like somebody wanted me to be a part of the program. So it made no sense um, to go to Notre Dame. And, and ironically, you'll love this too for irony. I waited for Notre Dame. I was waiting to get on that visit to go there. The day that Ohio State called and I said, you know what, I'm coming. So I, I called yeah. him back. I called the recruiting coordinator, called the head coach back, Coach Cooper, and said, hey, I'm coming. I'm in. I'm done. That's it. I'm, I'm closing my search. I'm coming to Ohio State. I'm committed to you guys. 
about an hour later, I got a call from Notre Dame saying, hey, we know it's late, <laughs> but we want to get you down for a visit. Is it too late to get you for a visit? I'm like, absolutely. Um, it's too late to get me down for a visit. I just came into a house about an hour ago, and I'm a person of my word, so I'm staying there. Um, there's nothing you can do yeah. to get me to come on a visit. But had you caught me last week and got me down there, I would have committed to you on the spot. And he was like, oh, I'm like, yeah, I mean, all you gotta do is get me down there. I would have, I would have come to Notre Dame. No questions asked. I would have been there. Um, so wow. we, we looked at it and, but it worked out better for me um, to go to a house set anyway. Yeah. That's, that's cool, man. You gave them, you gave them some great feedback. It's their loss. It was. Yeah. And I learned, sure. the, I learned the media guy. I knew the whole team. I knew the roster. I knew every coach that was already there. Um, <laughs> I was re- I mean, I was ready to go into Notre Dame knowing, knowing faces, numbers, names, positions where they were from what yeah. they could do like i had it all memorized then amazing you were ready that's so cool yeah so marlon you you know you're at ohio state at, you know one of the most you would probably say the most elite um big 10 or college football programs in the country definitely at the very 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 top right what right. what was if there is one thing that you took away from your time playing football for Ohio state from the coaching staff, your teammates, whomever, what was one big learning, learning lesson or lesson learned, if you will, um, think, that you've taken with you and you still hold on to that today. I think whatever it is you do, um, do it because you love it. Right. Um, I think um, coming into Ohio state, um, having never played really corner uh, and then coming in as a true freshman and playing, um, in every game as a, as a, as, as a true freshman um, and playing corner at, and playing against guys that I didn't know what I was doing at times, but like taking that coaching and taking that feedback, I think as I progressed and, and got better, I think the one thing that I ended up coming to realize um, was that you don't play this game or do anything for anybody else but yourself. Like you do it because you love it and that's what you want to do. Um, and so as I had ups and downs, which everyone has um, in their lives and, and, and trying to figure things out and navigate um, growing into my young adulthood myself, I think um, there was one thing that stood out to me my senior year because I, I wasn't playing well. I was trying to make it to the NFL. I had – it was a goal of mine since I was – since that, that fourth year, four-year-old incident knocking out my two front teeth. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it was so close, right? And I was so worried about am I going to make it to the league? Am I going to worry about this? That I forgot that I was playing football because I love to play football. And so – I wasn't playing well. I was pressing. I was making mental mistakes, um, giving up passes that I normally didn't give up, just hmm. just not really focused in the playbook like I should have because I was so focused on all these other things. And then I, I happened to have an aunt. She was murdered um, the night before football game, and I didn't hmm. know. Hmm. Um, and so when I came home, you know, everybody's like, I'm going to come pick you up. And I'm like, what's going on? What, what, why, why are you coming? And I'm trying to name people like, what happened to this person? And for some reason, I never aunt named that aunt. Um, and so when they came to pick me up and told me that she passed away and she had never seen me play at Ohio State, um, and we had probably talked the week before about her coming to a game, I wow. realized that life was too short and that all these other things that I was worried about was really trivial. Yeah. And so if I was going to play football, I played football um, for me. And if the league was going to happen, it was going to happen regardless, like I just needed to get there. And so I quit mm-hmm. worrying about all the, the other things that came into play, all yeah. the reasons why I couldn't do it, all the reasons why I should be somewhere else. And I just started focusing on, I love this game. I'm playing this game because I'm here. I, and I was probably better at being in the moment. I was more in the moment right then and there and uh-huh. focused and ended up having a, a, a better rest of the season. Um, but that was the one thing that I learned is that, you know, don't worry about anything else, just play and do it why and because of your why like find like the book simon um, simon says um, yeah. simon Zinnick, why, find your like play because of, find your why why you're doing it and yeah. then stay true to that stay true to that no matter what through the ups and downs stay true to your own why yeah that's awesome what do you say about that luke yeah that's that's incredible i think finding your why is like a consistent thing that a lot of people talk about on the show right not just doing it right. for a job or going through the motions mm-hmm. but figuring out what makes you tick I totally yeah, right. agree, man. Yeah, and I hope everybody listening really, really kind of honed in on what Marlon just said. Um, through his, through tragedy and in, in experiencing in his life, uh, and and not and then figuring out, you know, life is short, and it is, and nobody's yeah. guaranteed tomorrow. So when you learn that lesson, it's it's a tough lesson to learn, but it sets you on a different path. So learn it now before you have tragedy in your life, where <laughs> right. right, learn from others where you really focus on what you're passionate about and, and your, find your why 
do it today, focus on each day and stop worrying about what's to come years from now, because you'd really don't right. have any idea. Right. So you might, so right. just be happy and focused in the day and doing what you love and all, right. all the rest will come. That's super good. Yes, right. it will. Love that. Right. Yep. And I, I feel like that's some advice that everybody tells you, but it just takes a little while for people for it to sink in with people, you know, right. Uh, like yeah. I, Nick Saban has his process. I think he calls it where he makes sure people only focus on uh, what's going on at hand. Like for that moment, sorry, if my phone's ringing in the background here, it's actually my in-laws phone, but uh, no it's going to make the podcast more interesting, but, but yeah, he kind of breaks it down to like, Hey, all you have to do is perform in this next seven seconds. And he said, that's how they're able to cut, come back from like four touchdown deficits is because they're only focused on what's at hand right now, which in the business world, people don't do that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, we're always worried about what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? What's your one-year plan? Where do you see yourself? Right. So you don't teach people to say, stay in the moment, focus on what you can control now. Um, because yeah. if you lay the foundation now and focus on day to day, you can't change tomorrow and I can't change yesterday, but I can worry about the present. And so we try to do that. Um, I, I found a great quote um, that I try to use when I, when I get down on myself and say, don't let your past affect your present. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. so it's such, it's such a hard, it's such a, a, a something you sometimes you don't think about it, but you're like, listen, stop worrying about mistakes you made in the past. You can't go back and change those. You That's can't right. worry about the, the future because it hasn't happened yet. So don't let those things affect your present because we're, I, you know, I spent probably, um, and we'll probably get into this, but I've probably spent a good five years of my life trying to make up for something that happened um, that I couldn't control that mm -hmm. I kind of missed things going forward. I'm like, man, if I had done this or I had done that differently, if I had made this decision, this would have turned out totally different had I been paying attention. So, you know, uh, it's, it's still a lesson that I'm still learning and trying to teach myself still on a daily basis to stay true to, yeah. stay true to your why. Don't let your past impact you and just keep moving forward because mistakes happen and you can always overcome mistakes. Yep. Yeah, yeah you're right. That's, and I think being, yeah. a, being aware of it too. I, I started doing this thing, Bo, I don't even know if I told you this. I might have, but it worked. And Marlon, I'll, I'll, I promise I'll tie this back in, but I started doing like affirmations <laughs> where – I would say, so it was really easy. So here's what I did is I started saying, I, Luke Kerrigan, will start receiving checks in the mail. Like, how awesome is that, right? You just start getting checks in the mail. I, it worked. I started getting checks in the mail, and my wife was like, how, how is this, like, happening consistently? And I, what I told her is I was like, look, because I'm doing this affirmation, like, whenever opportunity presents itself – I'm figuring out a way to do it. So like, I'm just not missing opportunities. So one of the things yeah. I did was I did this affirmation, picked up the phone and it was for my homeowner's insurance. Found out I was paying like $2,000 a year over. What Whoa. Better, yeah. So <laughs> made a couple calls, switched it up. Since we had already paid for the year, I got a $2,000 check in the mail. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> it's like just yeah. those affirmations of being in that moment, you know, to your point, I think it, on a day-to-day -day basis, it opens up your mind to be open to those opportunities or to seek out those opportunities to do that. Even if it's something that simple is, uh, is what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Marlon said it. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you said it. Per it, it said, he said it in a way that I always think to myself and I'm talking to others, it sounds so simple, but in reality, it's, it's super profound because it's not always the easiest thing to do because your past can haunt you. You can dwell on it too much. Right. But it's the, right. like you said, yesterday, you cannot change it. You can't go back and you can't change anything about yesterday and you can't go into the future and, and set something up for yourself in the future. And you're and in reality, you are always in today when it's tomorrow for you. It's, it's today, right? right. It's still right. your today. So you're always in the present. That's how we live. Um, that's the reality we live in. We just have to always work on making that our reality and ensuring that just what Marlon said, um, that that's where you find your focus. Yeah. Right? And I, I think few people actually live in the present. Like if I don't know what the actual breakdown would be, if people are actually honest with themselves, but I think most of them either live in the past or they live in the future saying, Oh, well, things would be great if I, if I only had this and I'll work towards <laughs> yeah. that. Or, you know, oh, well, I did this in the past, so that's why I'm not happy right now. Like, I, I feel yeah. like most people live in the past or future. It's very hard to get, get over the past, right? Because there's hurts, 
um, yeah. that you kind of have to get over, right? So you have to want to acknowledge that, okay, maybe I made a bad decision um, where some people don't want to acknowledge that, hey, this was your choice. You, you chose to put yourself in a predicament that you're in, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you were just dealt um, a bad hand and you're just like, you know what, and you can't figure out how to overcome and navigate it. So you're trying to, trying to go through all those things. But you're right. Like it's at some point in time, you just kind of have to figure out how to navigate and get through to a point where like, you know what? I'm done. I'm over mm -hmm. it. Um, and so I, and I love what you said, Lucas. That's how I got to the position I was in. I, I was doing affirmations. I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm over with where I am. And the only way I'm going to get there is if I start believing. So I started telling myself outside, out loud, like, I'm going to be back working with the Bills. Um, and I would get up every morning and I would just say that. I, I kind of set mine up in a prayer style. And I would just say, Lord, I thank you for um, blessing me with the job with the Bills. Yeah. Didn't know what that job was going to be yet, <laughs> but just kept getting up saying that. And then, uh, and it ended up working that I ended up finding my way back um, into the organization and, and, and it ended up in my current role that I'm in now. But um, it, it was, I believe in affirmations. I mean, you can definitely set yourself up and open yourself up um, to maybe being more sensitive to opportunities that will come your way. Yeah, that's right. That's Absolutely. right. Absolutely. And so how do you do it in football? And like, here's a good example. So let's say you just completely blow a coverage, right? Quarterback throws a bomb, just, you know, throws a bomb right over your head. Uh, touchdown right right next next you got to come back out on the field man so like that you have to habitually learn how to get over that in a really short period of time and get back out there and get your head in the game is there anything like you taught yourself to be able to do that you know what i, I learned i it took me a while to really feel, realize this um i learned um how to be even keel and even tempered um for me um, not having played corner, I didn't understand all the little nuances, right? So um, I was like an emotional roller coaster, right? Like getting pumped up, getting the butterflies before a game. And I still got those even on a professional level, um, getting those butterflies. But in college, where, where a lot of young guys get in trouble is, is their emotions get them too amped up and too revved up, right? So you end up making this, you make decisions in the heat of the moment that you normally wouldn't make if you were just at a normally everyday practice, right? So in practice, mm -hmm. I could do everything right. In a game, I'm flying a thousand miles an hour, right? I'm, I'm too amped up. Um, and so I might make one little small half step um, or false step, and that gets me beat in position and out of position for a big play. Mm -hmm. And so then you're trying to make up for that big play because you understand, like in college football, that one game could be the difference of you playing for a national championship. So then you try to go back and compensate. Um, for the mistake you made, you make up for it, which is the opposite of what you should be trying to do. It should be like, that plays over. Uh, so when I got to professional level, I learned from um, our coaches that stay even keel. Like, don't get too high. Don't get too low. You make a good play. Okay, great. I take my high five. I take my dap from my guys. I, I slap on a helmet. Okay, I'm over it. I, I quit thinking about that. You make a bad play, same, same approach. Okay, you know what? It was a bad play. That one play is over. I got to go back and play. And so as I began and began to learn how to regulate my my own emotions, I became a better player because I wasn't up and down. I was just, here I am. I'm on the same playing field, same level at all times. And mm -hmm. ironically, I'm watching one of our, um, our really good corner we have on our team now, Tredavis White. That's him. Um, he's that. He's just like this all the way through. Like, he gets interception. You might see him act, act silly and do a quick dance on the field. Uh, but when he comes back on the sideline, he sits down, he takes his helmet off, and he's just like this. And I'm like, man, it's amazing to see how somebody who, who got it really early in, in, as a rookie coming in. Yeah. And now going into his fourth season that he got it early. And I'm like, wow, like, I wish I had learned that in college. I mean, it would have been, it would have paid huge dividends for me to be able to learn how to regulate my emotions and just stay even tempered so that I can just focus on what I, what my responsibilities were instead of getting too mostly too high and making that mistake. Well said. Oh. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So were you drafted out of college or did you have to walk on and make a team? How'd that, how'd I was that drafted out? out of college. Um, so I had that up and down senior season mm -hmm. um, and ended up having um, a, a pretty good second half of the season. Um, not the season I wanted, but I was, I was so thankful. Um, mm -hmm. And then ended up really just kind of, I, I ended up going to the combine um, and they lost my luggage at the combine, which is crazy. <laughs> so oh, wow. I'm in the combine um, and you fly in and the first day they, they could work you out and they have you going to like do leg extensions and do all these, all these things. And so I'm in jeans and Timberlands. I'm trying to do leg oh extensions. Gosh. Like, how many times can you do it? I'm like, I, I don't know. I have on boots. And so he's like, oh, okay. So I did it like 15 or 20 times, somewhere in that, in that range. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to be so sore tomorrow. And I did what I had to do that day. 
They found my luggage, uh, came back, and ended up um, running okay at the combine. But I interviewed all of the coaches. They were just asking me, talking to me. And I said, hey, if you had an opportunity to run track, would you? They said, yeah, I would do it. So I ended up running track <laughs> um, my last year at Ohio State as well. Wow. Um, ran track and was working um, on, on the combine and then came back and ran a 4.35 um, on my pro day. Um, and oh, I, I was like, yes, 4.35, yes. And then it's the same day that Joy Gallery ran a 417. <laughs> um, so then all of a sudden I got overshadowed <laughs> by a really good teammate, a good friend of mine at the time. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's funny. Seriously, Joey, like you ran a 417 when I ran a 435. I'm like, come on. But I remember the bills were there uh -huh. and they said, hey, what did you eat this morning? Like, what did you do? And I said, man, I just went to McDonald's and had some pancakes. And he was like, well, whatever you did, you need to eat those every day and do that every day. And I said, like, ah, you're funny. That's cool. And I said, I'll, I'll do that going forward. And lo and behold, um, the draft comes through and I was projected to go anywhere from round three to seven. Uh -huh. um, and I was like, okay. And I'm sitting there and my mom was still, my mom was back in the States, but they weren't back in Columbus yet. Um, they were in Rome, New York, um, which is like three hours from Buffalo, ironically. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, she was up there. So they came down, we were having a big draft party, just hanging out with friends um, and family. Uh, and we were doing it at my aunt's house. And in Ohio, we have uh, ESPN. That's back when it was um, started on Sunday, on Saturday at noon. You go all day to like 11:30 at night for the first three rounds, and then you do the other rounds on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, it, it would go from noon to seven on ESPN, and you go to ESP, ESPN two at seven. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, you have ESPN two, right? Yeah, I got it. I got them. Um, and and so we had ESPN, ESPN two, and they had the Sports Channel in Ohio. Uh -huh. um, which is kind of like a Cleveland-based station. And so when we go to switch to ESPN2, I'm like, okay, you got ESPN2, yes. Yep, I got it. See, it's right here. I'm like, that's not ESPN2. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that's the sports channel. So I couldn't watch the rest of the draft. Uh -huh. So I'm watching a ticker. I'm watching a ticker on the bottom go through. Uh -huh. And ironically, we're sitting in the house. It's like a 7.30, 8 o'clock, right? It's getting late. And I'm like, well, let's go bowling. <laughs> I, was like, uh -huh. I, was like, I was like, you know, I probably, I probably won't get drafted today anyway. I just wanted to watch it and see where my friends were going. Yeah. And they were like, okay, cool. So we're in the house. I'm, 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 I'm literally have on coats. Like I got my coat zipped up. I'm ready to go. And we're standing there. And I said, well, let me just go check and see where they are in the draft one more time before, I, before we leave. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. So I go in and I look at it. And it's, it says third round. And they're just going third round. And, and they're kind of getting in there in the 70s now. And I said, wow. I was like, they're in the third round. I said, I could be picked in this round. I'm like, maybe we should give it five minutes. And we're just kind of watching the name scroll down on the bottom. And then I have a cousin. We're probably like six months apart. So we're, we're the same age as I'm six months older. Mm -hmm. And she, 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 she's all like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be on the phone, I promise. Because, like, you know, I might right, get a call right, from the right. team, so stay off the phone. Yeah, okay, tell them the teenage girl that. <laughs> like, don't be on the phone, right? Come on. Yeah, so that's tough. So she, she calls up, Marlon. And I'm like, yes. She's like, telephone. I'm like, I didn't hear the phone ring. Who is it? I don't know, some guy from the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> and I'm like, really? I'm like, I thought I told you stay off the phone. And I pick up the phone, and the house goes quiet. Everybody's like, oh, my gosh. And I said, hello. Uh, and it's Dwight Adams, um, our former uh, head of scouting. Uh -huh. um, and, and, and he says, and he had the, the biggest and the hardest country draw I'd ever heard uh, in my life. And I, and I said, hello. And he's like, Marlon Kerner? And I'm like, yes, sir. And he's like, my name is Dwight Adams, and congratulations since you're a Buffalo Bill. Uh, and I'm saying wow. like, oh, this is crazy. This is awesome. And so I sat there. We talked for a minute. I, I talked to Coach Levy. I talked to um, our GM, John Butler at the time, um, who was a, um, a, he was a Big Ten guy. He went to Illinois yeah. um, and got off the phone. And it was kind of that surreal feeling. I got hugs from my mom and the rest of my family. Mm -hmm. And then we went bowling. <laughs> so that's we awesome. still went bowling. I was, I was like, I'm still going bowling. Let's go have some fun. Yeah, that's awesome. You can see how you can even now today you can see the excitement. I can see the excitement in you. Yeah. Um. That 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 was an amazing moment in your life. That's it awesome. It was. Yeah. Super super cool. So Buffalo Bills. And how long did you play for the Bills? So I played. I got four seasons in. Um. And that's where I started. I learned about staying even killed and and, uh -huh. and learning how to overcome fight um obstacles. Um. Was having a pretty good career. Came in as a rookie. Um. And started nine games. Wow. Um, and then started our, um, our last playoff um, win that we had um, and, and, and started um, the guy in front of me went to Notre Dame, um, Jeff mm -hmm. Burris, a good friend of mine still this day. 
Um, and we would have been teammates had, had I went to Notre Dame. Um, but it worked out better to go to Ohio State. But he tore his ACL. Um, so I ended up taking over for him and starting the rest of the season uh, and then played well my um, second and third year and then was having a pretty good season, third year and tore my ACL oh, with wow. three games left in the season. Uh, and so we're just kind of like, you know what? I'm not sure how this ACL thing's going to work out. Um, so as I'm getting pre- prepared to go um, and get surgery um, in, no- in December, like, I remember like it was yesterday because it was December the 15th. I'm hopping on a plane and I'm flying to Vail, Colorado. Mm-hmm. I'm going through Denver um, to go see Dr. Statman at the Statman Hawkins Clinic um, up there. And I'm on the phone calling Ohio State because I had three classes left that I needed to take to graduate. Oh, and wow. so we had this whole back and forth with the Bills training staff. I'm like, listen, I'm like, just in case this ACL thing doesn't work out and I don't come back and be the player that I am, um, I have been taking classes in the offseason up through then all that time anyway. Um, mm-hmm. So I said, I'm going to go back to school um, during this offseason and I'm going to go back and take these three classes and I'm going to graduate. And then yeah. if you need me to come back every weekend, I will. If you need me to fly somebody down to look at me while I'm doing my rehab, no problem. I'll do whatever I need to do, but I'm going to graduate. And we yeah. went back and forth on this and they're like, no, I'm like, I'm graduating. I don't really care what you guys say. I'm gone. Um, so they said, they finally said, okay, no problem. Go ahead. Um, but if you need to be back here anytime, not a problem. It's a five hour drive. I'll drive, I'll fly, I'll do whatever I need to do. So mm-hmm. went back. Um, I'm, I'm getting ready to get in surgery and they're prepping me. Like I literally hopped on a plane, no food, no drink, fly across the country, get in a, a car, um, they drive up to um, the Colorado uh, and then they say, okay, we got to prep you. So I'm like, I, you can't have anything to drink, no anything else until you come out of surgery. And hmm. so I'm like, okay. I, and I'm on the phone. Like, before we do this, let me make one phone call. And yeah. I call and, 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 and my advisor answers. I say, I just want to make sure you got the check overnight it for tuition. Yeah. She said, you're all set. I'll see you um, January 4th. And so I, I had the surgery, successful surgery, came back um, on crutches with stitches in my left knee um, mm-hmm. and walked to campus and 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 started taking my three classes to graduate wow. and graduated nice. that march um got the stitches out did my rehab with ohio state and yep. then came back here and did all the rehab back in buffalo um but i was a college graduate and then mm-hmm. did all the rehab had a little setback and they were draining some um, syringes of blood out of my knee so i was mm-hmm. having some issues in there but i was still trying to play uh and then did all the rehab got cleared to play made the team made the roster and then get in the first game against san diego and i tear my right acl Oh my gosh. Oh, yep. So oh, I'm sitting there like, oh my gosh. Like, so I'm, I'm so heartbroken, so disappointed because I knew how hard I worked. Yeah. Um, and so I just, okay, I got to go back to work. So that was my whole me- mentality. Let's uh-huh. get back to work. Um, and so I called all my friends, like all my DBs. I called every last one of them personally. I said, hey, I don't even want you to hear this um, from the news outlets or anybody. You're going to hear it from me first. Um, I just want to let you know I tore my ACL yesterday. Um, and I'm going to be having surgery again, um, and I'm going to be put on IR. Um, and so I called all, all my guys, let them know that, mm-hmm. and then went back on IR and had the surgery and then had to have surgery on my left knee because it just wasn't right. There was a lot of things still going on with that. Yeah. Um, and then it just was never right, just too much damage, um, trying to have, um, trying to fix two ACLs in, in the span of a year. Yeah. Um, and That's it was tough. just a lot to try to really try to do um, and having to have a microfracture off the knee that was – the original um, ACL injury, there was some cartilage damage that was um, that didn't um, show up in the first MRI that we did when we had the surgery. So mm-hmm. we had to go back and fix that. And it was just a lot to overcome. So four years in, done, and then left football. Um, and that's where I talk about um, where, you know, you kind of make decisions um, based off of how you feel at the time. So I was upset um, because I felt like I failed, right? Like yeah. I had this whole plan of what I wanted to do, um, how many years I was going to play, the businesses sure. I was going to start, all the things I was going to do. Um, after I played football. And so I didn't want to be around football because I felt like I failed. So I left. Like I got mm. completely out of football where I probably had I stepped back and really just, and, and talked it through and thought it through, I would have stayed and said, maybe let's go on the coaching or stayed and went into scouting or did something um, or yeah. stay closer to player engagement where I'm in now, where I could have just been around it to kind of help guys navigate some of the pitfalls that I had to yeah. go through. Right. Um, but it was it was cathartic for me to get away from football at, then. So I left. I just went. I got a job um, with KeyBank. I was newly married. Um, was about to have my first son. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get out of football completely um, and made that decision um, to walk away uh, and, and worked in banking for four years, did. Um, don't know why I went to retail, but kind of glad I did because I, I learned some great, some great customer service skills. Um, I, and I worked at a grocery store for two years and then I worked at Target for eight years. Um, and I wow. was always in a leadership role. 
Um, and so then it kind of helped me be able to do the role that I'm in now um, because yeah. I had all that managerial experience coming into it. So I understood how to talk to people. I understood how to talk to customers. I understood how to do all those things and really listen with empathy on both sides and then be able to say, okay, yeah. let's go down what's best for every party involved. So it made it a little bit more easier, but I, I didn't look at it that way. I had, it took me a while as I got older to kind of realize like, Hey, everything that happens happens for a reason. So for yeah. me, I, I was so gra grateful that I got the opportunity to kind of learn all those things and make my mistakes and grow on my own um, because mm -hmm. it set me up to be in the role that I'm in now. Yeah. I think that's amazing. That's great experiences for you to, um, to you to, for you to pull in, pull into your current role. And today you're the director of player engagement and alumni for yes. the Buffalo Bills. So you made it back. I made it back. Yeah. How'd you get back? You know, um, I was probably at that point where I started thinking about the affirmation and I was like, you know what? I don't know if I really want to do this for the next 40, is it, for 40 years. Like, is this yeah. my life? Am I really going to do this for the rest of my life? When uh -huh. I was watching guys make mistakes, I was like, man, you know, I was in that situation before I've been there. I, I, I could have given some wisdom to him and say, Hey, maybe think of it this way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started just saying, you know what? I said, you know, one of these days I'm going to be in that role. I, I, I'm going to be able to help these guys and be in a position to give them some wisdom so they, can don't, so they don't have to make the same mistakes that I made, right? Because yeah. I'm a big believer of, hey, you know what? You're going to bump your head and make your, some of your mistakes, but you don't have to make your, all the mistakes, right? You can kind of listen right. to some of the mistakes I made and don't go through what I did and maybe don't take the same path that I took and maybe learn from my mistakes so you don't have to make the same ones and go better and right. be better than I am. Um, so... I happened to bump into one of our VPs of marketing. His name was uh, Mark Honan. Um, and he was, um, we were at a golf tournament. He said, hey, we're looking to do an alumni department um, and we want to have a former player headed up. Would you be interested? I'm like, sure. And he said, you know, not sure when it's going to happen. Um, our owner, um, our original owner, Mr. Wilson, had just passed um, and they were trying to figure out who was going to buy the team. So it was mm -hmm. coming down to um, the Bon Jovi-led group who wanted to take the Bills to um, Toronto. Um, and uh, Kim and Terry Pagula, who also were owners of the Buffalo Sabres, and they, and they were saying, we're going to keep the Bills in Buffalo. Um, so everybody was hoping that this, um, the Pagulas would um, get the bid. Um, they ended up getting the team. Uh, yeah. And then that I saw him in April um, of the year before they were approved to buy the team. Um, like about four or five months later, they were approved to buy it. Um, and then a year, it, it took a year for me to even get back and have the conversation again of, hey, are you still going to do that? Um, so I was kind of looking to kind of maybe make that move out of Target. I was kind of like, I felt like I had reached um, my peak. I had grown where I was going to grow and, and I needed to kind of find another challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was looking, actively looking, and I had applied to other places and they were like, no. And I was like, why am I not getting this job? Like, I'm qualified. And I would hear, you're overqualified, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have two months experience for this role. I'm like, how do you have two months experience when, you're, when I'm telling you, I think I would love to do this role? No, you yeah. know, we think – we think that you're too qualified and, you know, we wouldn't be able to pay you. I'm like, I'm not worried about the pay. Like I, I would take the pay cut um, depending on if we, yeah. we could come to an agreement. And they're like, no, you know, we, we just can't, we can't do that. But I didn't understand. It was just, it wasn't my time. It wasn't yeah. time for me to leave yet. And so I, had, I, I, I stayed with Target. I stayed focused. We got through. And then the, I got the phone call that says, hey, um, you know, I, I, I want us to do that position and I want you to come and meet with Russ Brandon, our, our president. Uh -huh. And I went in and talked to Russ and he said, Hey, here's my vision. What do you think? And I said, here's what I think um, we, we should be doing with this. And he said, okay, we align. And he's like, you know, you're the guy that I want for this position. Um, and so uh -huh. I ended up, ended up doing that. And then about a month later, um, you know, talked to target and said, Hey, I'm out. You know, like, unfortunately I thank you for the eight years I've, I spent here learned right. a lot, but it's time for me to take on a new challenge. And, and, and came to the Bills as a director of alumni only. Um, and then we had a coaching change um, in 2017. Uh, so about a year and a half into my role, um, uh, Sean, Sean, Sean McDermott took over mm -hmm. and he decided that he wanted somebody um, who had played the game before and who had transitioned out. Um, yeah. And, you know, as coaches do, they go and look for their guys. So he went and looked for one of his guys. Um, and those guys were like, Hey, I'm not available. And so they, he kind of heard that I was um, working for the organization and we sat down and we talked uh, and he gave me his vision for the role. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I he said, you know, I, I, I think about it, you know, Hey, don't, don't make that decision now, go home, think about it, take the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and I'm like, okay. And we, I talked over my wife and we, and we discussed it and, and it came back and said, yes, you know, I'd love to be in this role and love to be director of player engagement. So that's how I ended up getting into the player engagement space. Wow. 
That's a, that's a, yeah, that is a journey. <laughs> it was a lot. That's a, was, a lot. Was a that's a journey, journey for sure. <laughs> yeah. But it's great. Uh, so you've enjoyed it so far to I've date. I mean, it, you've yes. been there since 2015, uh, yes. back with the bills. So five years, r- roughly yes, five I years. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I laugh now because like, well, like I said, when I said everything I did prepared me for the roles that I were in when I was with the bills. Right. So the first thing I had to do when I came in as the director of alumni was, build the database like we had an old spreadsheet we didn't know what numbers were correct we didn't know what address and emails were correct so i literally had to cold call people like literally i'm picking wow. the phone and i'm saying hey um this is going to sound strange um but my name is marlon and i'm the director of um, i'm the director of alumni with the buffalo bills and i wanted to reach out to say ken Irvin, who was a good teammate of mine for example right and so i'm cold calling guys but when i worked at key bank i worked in their inbound and outbound call centers uh-huh. where I actually cold called people. <laughs> so I understood how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, I could do this in my sleep. I can do this all day. Like I can make a phone call. I understood how to put people at ease and like, Hey, you know what? If you don't believe me, here's the phone number. You can call back, call this number. Here's yeah. my email address. And so I was able to kind of use the skills that I had built across um, the time of being out in, in, as I like to call real world to yeah. come back and be in this, in this new roles that I was being put into like, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I understand why I had to go through some of my experiences in order to be successful in the role that I was being put in with, with the bill. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's super cool. Now, does, does every NFL team have this, or is this something that's more unique to the Bills? Um, every NFL team has a director of player engagement. Um, okay. So that's kind of something that the, um, the, actually now it's in, in the CBA. The CBA calls for – um, a director of player engagement, um, and pretty much our job, depending on how the coaches view them mm-hmm. um, and how the coaches want to use them, is we're like, kind of like the liaison um, for the coaches. So our job is really to help those guys transition in um, as rookies coming into the NFL um, and then help them at, on their journey while they're here and then be there for them when they get ready to transition out. Um, and so for some guys like Lorenzo Alexander, it's 15 years, or a Kyle Williams, it's fit 13 years. Um, or you get guys like me that, hey, you have a couple injuries, you're out. Or I had a guy who spent one season, he came in, um, had a Liz Frank injury, got put on the IR, came back the next year, got cut, and that was it for him. He's hmm. done. He's no longer in football. Um, yeah. So we kind of help those guys navigate wherever, however long it's going to be when they're in the league. And you, hopefully you educate them enough to understand, like, take advantage of some of the perks and benefits, save some money, put it aside. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I'm not telling you how much you should save because I think that's a personal choice. and. Wealthy right. to everyone is their own personal definition. So I say define what's wealthy to you and then let's come up with a plan to figure out how you're going to get there. If yeah. you need to take care of parents and families and friends, let's just make sure you do that in a, re- in a responsible way so that you don't sacrifice your future for taking care of somebody for the next two years when you can set up and take care of them and yourself for, the, for a lifetime. Um, so we yeah. just try to have conversations like that. That's, a, That's yeah, cool. that is super cool. I it's love an that. important role. It, it is. Yeah, you're like an inside, you're an inside mentor to for whatever situation guys like like yeah, you just get to explained, help right? mentor guys we get to help guys build transition plans so it's yeah it, it's a lot um, a lot of responsibility and and it's evolved over the time yes. yeah i bet I hey, bet it's, it has. it's got to be so difficult this even in the business world when i see younger reps that like come into the companies that i've worked for we're not even talking like they're not at the top of their game right? It's still right. tough to deal with them because they haven't learned life lessons yet, right? Now I'm thinking, right. man, you get someone 21 years old that's coming out of a major university getting what, two-week paychecks that look like 700 grand every two weeks or something like that? Like, just mentally getting them to <laughs> fall into place into the coach's system has to be so important. It is. Uh, you're trying to get them to perform. And, and, and so we, we always have this, this new thinking, um, where we're like, listen, I can't even help you transition if you don't figure out how to, how to perform, right? Because if you don't make the team, there's nothing to transition out of. Like, you're here and you're gone. Um, yeah. and, and so we kind of get guys to understand, like, I need you to understand how important it is to learn that playbook. I need you to understand how important it is to be able to take whatever little reps you get and be mentally on par and learn how to get mental reps in because if you can't perform when the coaches want you to and you – may only get three reps in a practice. That's just how it is as a rookie, yeah. especially an undrafted guy. You don't get a lot of opportunities to improve yourself. So if you can't do those things, you're not going to be here. Uh, and then going back to your point about the money, 
Like they they don't get paid um, in two weeks. They get paid right now, and this is the last year they do it. They get paid in seventeen paychecks. So you Stop. come in from week what? one, you get yes, you get you get one. You play one game, you come back and went that Thursday of week two. You, you get a paycheck, and you get a paycheck all the way through for seventeen weeks, and then that's it. So I'm trying to help guys understand, uh, like you may think this is a lot of money, and it is. You know, you're making thirty four thousand dollars before taxes um, in a week, and then you cut that in half. You take out your NFLPA dues. You're bringing home sixteen, seventeen thousand um, dollars, depending on where we play that week. Yeah. Um, and sometimes fourteen a week, or if you have any any other thing, tickets or anything that you do come out of it, you're bringing home fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars a week. But it's got to last you for fifty two. And so we yeah. have this conversation yeah. of like, you're getting seventeen paychecks that will last you for fifty two weeks. I understand that now. So really trying to get these guys really to understand like. You know, because that's that's a big eye opening experience for guys. Like they don't understand. Like, oh my gosh, look at this paycheck. This is amazing. No, it's not amazing because you're not gonna get another paycheck after week 17 unless we, unless we make the playoffs. Right. And so you're like, oh, I didn't understand that. I I didn't know that. Yeah. Like I need you to help understand that you got to budget this, set it out, do some really good things here. Um, and oh, by the way, you're gonna pay your agent fees on that full amount. Um, so you're gonna pay whatever that between a half a percent and four percent on top of that. And you also got to pay taxes in every state that you play in, by the way. And you're like, what? <laughs> well, that's weird. Isn't that, like, so you're going to get an accountant isn't that, isn't to go along with that. <laughs> so, that yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That is, that is a maddening yes. thing because it's their job. It's their work. So wherever you work, states you physically work in, and they are, right? They're working their game. That's their job. Yes. And they're going to pay tax. Yep. And that's, that is wild. So, so what's wild. The, what's the worst state to go into then? Like California, I'm thinking of California, California, and then followed by New York. Um, <laughs> are like the worst states um, <laughs> when it yeah. comes to taxes and New York state always, they never take out enough state taxes um, um, for you. So I've had so, so many guys come back at the end of the year. Like, man, I had to pay New York state tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Wow. I didn't, I had no idea. I'm like, yeah, they tax you hard here. That's yeah. it's, it's, it's an open experience with guys. It, it's crazy. So I ve bet. The Vegas is where you'd want to play. Now you want to go visit, you want to visit the Raiders stadium. They got no, t no state taxes there. Do they? Um, I, I think the taxes are a little different. Um, you, you, a lot of guys want like Florida. So yeah. you want to play for Jacksonville or the dolphins. Um, just because, you know, Hey, no state tax, or you want to play for um, Houston or the Cowboys, there's no state tax. Um, or you want to play for uh, the Titans because um, there's no state tax in Tennessee. So you try to find all the states, and then you hope yeah. you have those teams on your schedule. Yeah. <laughs> so luckily for us, we played it. We go to Miami once a year. So I'm like, yes, I know that we're not getting taxed when you go to Miami, but we yeah. play the Jet in New Jersey. So I'm getting New Jersey taxes. And so you get all those things that just kind of come into it. The guys aren't taught coming out of college yeah. that um, you need to be on the lookout for. Um, and then, you know, you look at um, your agent fees because your agent fees want to gross. Um, and so, you know, you're like, hey, your agent's not saying, oh, you, you, you brought home X amount. Uh, yeah. Right, give me 2% of that. No, hey, a rookie minimum this year is 610. So, all right, if it's, uh, give me my 3% of $610,000. Thank you yeah. very much. All right, I'll take that. But you're, you're taking yeah. it out of the 50% that you bring home. So it gets, that pie gets smaller really quickly. Uh, you know, yeah. so we just had to have yeah. guys really understand, like, you know, if, if you're making 610, cut it in half and start with 305. And then start paying your expenses and everything out of that 305. And then also be ready to pay extra taxes. And then if you sign a shoe deal, <laughs> understand that's additional income that hasn't been taxed yet. And you will that's get right. a 1099 for it. Um, so guys are like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm just trying to help you out on some things that you're not ready for, that you're not really thinking about yet. But these yeah. are some of the things that you could be prepared for so that you can set yourself up. Yeah. So that's 610. That's a great point because the 610, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's not money. It's not equal money. So it depends on where you right. play, what state you're in, the tax implications of each state. Um, yeah, so it's not equal, right? It's dependent. It no. just all depends, right? Wherever no, it you all end depends. up, all it's depends. All depends. Very subjective. Yes, it is. That sucks. Yeah. And, and then you're and in the highest. Where... Then, yeah, and you're in the highest tax bracket, right? Yep. So highest tax bracket. <laughs> you're gonna pay the most tax. Yeah, that's, it, that's wild. In some cities, like yeah, that's not a lot of money. I mean, you cut it in half. You three oh five. Three oh five is a lot of money in um, Florida. For example, like we were just talking yeah, about. Or, yeah, yeah, or here in Ohio. Yeah, in right? San Francisco, in Manhattan, that is not a right. lot of money. <laughs> yeah. It is that? not, no. <laughs> those, are really, those are really good insights. I love hearing that. No, that's yeah, good. you're right. I mean, and, and that's the thing we look at, guys, like, 
Yeah. Wow. So t- today with, with what's happening uh, with the coronavirus and all this type of stuff and the unknowns about the, the next season coming up and how, how everything's going to go. Do you have, a, and given your role in the position that you're in, you're in, do you have, I mean, are, are players freaking out or are they getting anxious about how things are going to roll, how things are going to happen and, and what's coming here and you know, shortly, if you will, are you dealing with, are you personally dealing and helping guys through, through this time and we the try. uncertainties? Yeah, we, we try. I mean, we try, we're there for guys. Um, if they have um, questions, I think a lot of guys are really worried about the virus and how it might impact them and their families um, mm-hmm. and what that looks like. Um, but I think a lot of guys still want to play. Um, so we're preparing for having training camp, which ours is supposed to start here in a couple of weeks. Um, so our guys have some of our, uh, our guys have really been working out. We've been in contact with them, just checking in on them. Um, it's kind of the dead period. So I let guys have their vacation time and their time away from us. Um, but I'm starting to text guys like, all right, how you doing? How you feeling? Mm-hmm. When you planning on getting back in here, just checking in on them, seeing if they need anything from me. Uh, and then we really just kind of just are waiting to see how everything else will play out. Right. Um, mm-hmm. How, if there's going to be preseason games, um, if the season's going to start on time. Um, and those are just answers that nobody has um, any answer to just yet. Yeah. So that's all still uncertain. Still uncertain. Oh. Yep. But, Fingers crossed. We are fingers crossed that we'll have a season. Gosh, I hope so. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I hope so. I really do. <laughs> yeah. I really do. I even, at this point, I'd really be happy with, like, have you seen what the kids are doing in, like, major cities that, uh, like, Justin Fields, uh, Justin Field came out of where they're doing the pass-only summer leagues? I'd, just be, I'd be happy with that, Marlon. <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything just to get football back. If they, if they say, you know, look, I- I'd be happy with it. <laughs> You know, I think um, some of our guys might be cool with it. I, it's, it's still the same thing, right? How do you quarantine and keep guys um, safe by doing it, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you can do a pass league, um, and, and a lot of our guys would do it, but then you, you would exclude all the offensive linemen, right? Because all yep. the linemen are really on coming in, the, in, the, in that pass league, so you're not going to have a, a lineman camp where they're going to come in because then you're worried about the same thing. So I think yeah. really it's just going to be a matter of how do you best protect guys? How do you get creative with practices so that, you, you minimize the amount of contact that you need to have on a weekly basis and just worry about it when you get together for a game. Whether, whether that's you have one day where you come together as a team and you're kind of doing all your team functions on one day and everything else is kind of an individual. Um, you know, you, you can be really creative on how you do it to make sure that you don't sacrifice having the games uh, and, 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 and giving back TV revenue and then more importantly, really not having a good product for the fans. I mean, because, right, yeah. you know, we play this game because we love it, but we also play it because you know, the fans are there and they support us. And so we want to make sure that we give something back and give a good product for the fans as well. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I'm, I'm with you. It, it, it'll be, uh, I don't know. I'd be as I, some things are going to lack with that, like the timing of all the linemen and everything, if you're doing everything, but you know, I'm a bears fan. So if everybody else in the league's timing is off, I'm cool with that because maybe, maybe the level of the playing field. And we can, <laughs> although we'd need Look, a, y'all should have just, y'all should have just drafted Mahomes when you had a chance, but we had gosh, a chance. Gosh, right. <laughs> He's but Josh Allen should have taken Mahomes. He's really good. Yeah, he's nuts. He's, <laughs> yes. a, you know, getting back to, like, having a short memory and just getting after it and uh, going for the next play. Like, Mahomes kills it at that, right? We looked yes. at the last yes. Super Bowl. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I thought it was done until, like, what, eight minutes left? Hey, that, that's why you got to play a full four quarters. Uh, and you can't celebrate too early. You can't look at the clock like, oh, it's over. up by 10. There's no way they come back. No, they can come back. They, they score quickly. Um, and they did. I was just sitting looking like, wow, this is, this is amazing. So I was amazing. glad that KC came back. I was too. I was too. Uh, so Marlon, let's, let's traverse to ongoing current events and what's happening and how's the NFL or how, how are you experiencing it with your players uh, and with alumni um, just with, you know, protesting and everything that's happening and, and in organizations now, I think more than ever, um, looking at tr- truly how to finally make change when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging, uh, how to stop the, how to stop the superficial, um, you know, superficial attempts to make it look like we're doing something, but we're not really doing anything, right? right. To, to actually committing to, to improving our 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 workplace environments, um, whether it's an NFL team or elsewhere. 
Um, do you have players speaking up about that for, for the Bills or alumni, you know, wanting to know what's happening with the organization, what are we doing, and, and so forth? Uh, Player-wise, we do. We do have players, and I apologize if I'm breaking it out. I think – my wife is also doing a Zoom call somewhere, ah, um, so we're competing That's okay. for bandwidth, and I'm and I'm outside. Um, but we do have um, players um, that are speaking up. Um, I know uh, Cole Beasley, um, one of our receivers um, from Dallas, um, who's who came over from Dallas last year, um, had a had a really good post that he put on on Instagram where he just talked about um, that he would no longer be silent, um, and he had a really good take on it just because he's married to a black female. Um, mm -hmm. um, so. You know, he has uh, biracial kids. And so he talked about things that in lessons that he was going to have to take um, that he was learning from watching all this play out. Um, yeah. Jerry Hughes has been vocal. Um, uh, Lorenzo Alexander has been very vocal um, in this space. Um, our, our, our coach, Frazier, um, our assistant head coach and, and defensive coordinator has been very vocal in the space. Um, we have Josh Norman, um, who's very vocal um, and has done his own thing. He's part of uh, the player coalition um, that was formed with mm -hmm. Anquan Bolden um, and Malcolm Jenkins uh, and the NFL players. So he's been pretty vocal about it. Uh, and then even myself, I've been trying to help um, spark um, that conversation as well, right? Because when you look at it from um, an organizational standpoint, most organizations are pretty siloed when it comes to, it's like football and the coaches and the players and everything yeah. here. And then you have your business side and everything else over here, right? right. So while the players were able to have conversations and talk and say, hey, this is bothering me. And they were able to kind of talk to their coaches and, and do it in, the, in their meeting rooms um, mm -hmm. via Zoom. The organization really didn't. And so we were having conversations and sidebars, like what can we do? Uh, and so I was able to help spearhead a town hall um, where we actually um, had over 300 people across the Bills, across the Sabres and across PSC come mm -hmm. in and start talking about race. And so we yeah. actually set up um, myself and Coach Fraser, uh, Lorenzo was the moderator um, and Jerry Hughes, and we just kind of shared um, our own experiences um, being um, black in America, being black mm -hmm. as athletes, and me um, being a former athlete, and then being kind of representing the business side um, right. and how that looks. Um, and we weren't we weren't trying to go back. Well, you know, because I think sometimes you know when when you when you have this conversation, it's already tough to have anyway, right? Like you know, the things that we never talk about. We don't talk about race. We don't talk about politics. You know, you don't talk about money. Um, hey, how much do you make? Well, I make. You don't talk yeah. about that. That's a no no. Sex yeah. is a no-no as you're talk, coming up, right? So you have mm -hmm. all these topics that you don't talk about. And so, you know, when you, when you do, people get defensive. And so you have to be, you know, sometimes it's good to be just upfront and blunt because some people have to have it that way to understand it. But a mm -hmm. lot of people will get closed off, right, and become defensive. Yeah. So we weren't trying to make people feel closed off. We wanted people to feel like they were a part of the conversation. Yeah. And so we, we, we called the series Listen, Learn, um, Love, right? Um, nice. Because we wanted to, to listen to somebody else's perspective and get a, and gain new insight on what it's like to look like me and be in the role that I'm in. Um, and then I wanted you to then learn what, what I went through and, and maybe learn what somebody else went through. And then, and then hopefully that will turn into love. Like, Hey, you're going to love, Hey, that, you know what? That's a good man. You know what? And so you, cause you don't understand the stories behind how somebody got there and maybe what right. they really went through to get to where they got to where they are now. Yeah. And so sometimes by giving you a different perspective, you kind of, you have a new appreciation for that person and it makes you go, ah, Okay, uh, and so we, 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 we set up a, a series where we, we started June, uh, um, June 11th. We're going to have one next week, and then we'll have one in August, um, and then one every month until the end of the year where we'll reevaluate um, and kind of collect all the information that we learned, um, mm -hmm. and then we'll kind of come back and say, here's what we're going to initiate going forward, and then here's how we'll keep that town hall going after that. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I, I like that. So, yeah, I do. I love the, uh, the commitment to that. Um, I was talking with this morning, uh, one of the, the gentlemen who kind of got you on our show, uh, Marcus Ogden, and he and I were on a call this morning and we were talking about, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, uh, consulting and all this type of thing and doing things like you're doing at your organization. And yeah, we're, we're on the same page where we really want to see people commit companies, organizations right. commit to a longer lasting endeavor to actually make change. Yeah. Right? right. So one town hall that might've been years ago, but one <laughs> town hall is not enough. Right. It's right. Not, it, you know, you might leave it and say, Oh, that was a good town hall. We learned a lot. Like we listened, learned and we, we, we got something from it. Um, but it would have been a short lived uh, results out of that.
so I, I applaud you and your organization for committing to something more long-term and doing it regularly <laughs> right. to actually make change. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And, and, we, and we understand it's not, we don't want, we don't want to be a fad, right? I think that's right. the thing we're looking at. Like, let's not make it be the cool thing to say black lives matter, or I'm going to hire a diverse um, candidate because it's the cool thing to do. Like I want you to hire um, the best candidate available, but I want you to have a commitment to saying, Hey, I want to change the makeup of my leadership team yeah. and the makeup of, my my employee pool by proactively seeking out somebody that looks different than what I already currently have in my organization yeah. um, that but then also be realistic like don't just do it because it sounds good now because in six months or a year it may it, it might be a new new fad that's out and so we're looking at it as a this is a three-year plan this is a five-year plan this is a 10-year mm -hmm. plan because in order to see real change you have to give it time and you have to come up and, and say okay what worked this year how can we improve it? How can we make right. it better? So we're trying to figure that out as an organization. Like, what are we going to do as an organization to do those things? And how can we get better at it and then enforce it? And then more importantly, get everyone to buy into it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because well, I mean, time, man, it, it's so different out there now. Like we're way past the, uh, the point of just driving awareness, right? Like, trust me, people are aware. They know. Now companies are actually getting called out for like having just like, commercials or whatever where they're like oh we, we you know we stand with black lives matter and then they do nothing about it so right the activists are they're calling it passive activism right like so now they're getting shamed which is kind of cool to see that like hey you're getting shamed because you're just trying to do this for a, a media and publicity right now yeah and you don't want to you know take real change so it's kind of cool to see uh you know organizations like yours or organizations that are actually like all right it, we're way past the point of awareness. Like what changes can we make now? And then to your point, what do we do three, five, 10 years down the line? And what does that look like? Yeah. yeah. NFL's done a great job with it. On the last episode we had, we talked about the Rooney rule in the NFL. Oh uh, uh, yeah. That Rooney rule. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that, and, it, it, it's got some, it's got some holes um, that it needs to get fixed. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept and I love the concept behind it. Um, but I like to call it affirmative action with no teeth, right? Like, yeah. hey, I, I, I want to get you, I'm going to get you to the point and the intent was pure and I love the intent behind it. But I mean, what are you going to tell a, a billionaire owner? Hey, I, you got to interview somebody, but you don't have to hire anybody. Yeah, uh, You just got to interview somebody. We're, we're hoping that you would do the right thing. Like, you know, you, you need to do some unconscious bias training, right? I mean, you yeah. need to have people understand that, hey, you know, I, I, I'll give you the great example, right? Uh, David Tepper, um, owner of the Panthers, yeah. right? When he said he, when he said he hired Matt Rule, um, he said one thing that showed how unconscious bias plays into how we make decisions. Because he said he reminded me of me. We were short order cooks. <laughs> like I was a short order cook. Like he came in and he dressed how I would have dressed. He had on a t-shirt and some shorts. So, like I felt so comfortable being around him. That's unconscious bias. That's yeah. creeping in right there. Like you didn't give anybody else another opportunity. And I'm not saying Matt Rule wasn't the best candidate um, for the job, but at the end of the day, it goes to show you how far we still need to go. Um, and then some of the, um, I, I wouldn't say pitfalls, but some of the limitations of the Rooney Rule, because you're just saying, I just got to interview you. And so it turned into, we're just going to interview Eric the enemy. And that was it. You didn't interview anybody else. He was kind of the guy I passed around because you knew um, he was, it, it was going to be a great interview. And then, but you weren't going to hire him. Um, and so that was kind of how it went through. And then, you know, they hired Rule and then Judge got hired for the Giants. Same way. Like, okay, you didn't really give somebody a chance, really. It was kind of like, ah, we're going to go through this, go through the motions interview, um, which is what we don't really want to have when you were to look at that rule. You want, you want true yeah. progress. You want people, if, if you're just going to go through the motions, I'd rather not go through the interview unless I'm just trying to get experience um, to see what it's like to be in, to interview for a head coaching job. I, I, I agree. You, and I hate it because you waste people's time. You, you know, all those people that you're doing just because, okay, I agree. I'll, I'll interview them, but you have absolutely zero intention of hiring them because you've truly already made right. this election, right? That, that there's no respect right. in that. There's no, there's no honor in that. You are, you, you are really, yeah. Oh, I hate that. I really do. Yeah. But I mean, I think they have some rules to try to make it better. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing how they implement um, maybe some other things to do. And I would love to see them really create a network, right, where up and coming coaches really can be around owners because that's it's going to take um, really 
a lot of things to go, but we, you need to be comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Like the owner still needs to be comfortable enough to say, I'm, I'm going to um, be able to hire this coach regardless, um, um, especially, you know, when you're like talking about trying to be diverse, right? If you don't normally hang around with somebody in that circle, you know, yeah. it's, it's new to you. Like, and so you, if you're not mm -hmm. really comfortable, you know, we, we all tend to gravitate toward the circles that we're comfortable with. And generally that tends to be people that look like us or that think like us or that act like us. Um, and so if you don't intensely seek out people and try to introduce um, a different thought and a different look into your inner circle, you're going to find yourself with a lot of people that kind of act and think and look um, and talk the same way as you. Um, and so we see that in the coaching ranks, especially in the head coaching ranks, is they kind of reflect the circle of the people that are making the hiring choices. Yeah, on point. It's true. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely true. <laughs> Got to fix those things. Yeah, we do. If you're so, listening and you are in a position of hiring authority, please pay attention to what was what was just said. Go back and uh, pause and go back, rewind, listen to that again. Yeah, try it. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so, so that's a that that's a great point to say. Uh, we've kept you here for an hour, over an hour now. It's been a great episode. You've shared so much insight, and I think there's there's so many powerful points for for our listeners to take away from from the discussion. Uh, fell right in line for sure with our with our tagline, and let's get after it, and let's just keep keep doing better, doing everything we can to do better, and encourage others to do the same. So Marlon, when we close out our show, uh, we like people to, we like our guests to close us out. And so you, you can close us out with whatever you'd like to say, with whatever, whatever uh, inspiration you want to leave the listeners with, uh, and then, and then end it with that's a wrap. Okay. You're up. So I got to end it with that's a wrap and give out some inspiration. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So guys, thank you for taking the time to listen to um, this podcast and this episode I hope you really learned a lot and gained a lot. Um, I am not perfect by any means necessary, um, and I'm still a work in progress. Um, so I hope that if you take anything out of um, anything I said is that you too can overcome any obstacles that you face in your path. You don't have to have all the answers. Um, just don't be afraid to try, right? Um, you know, for so long, I would beat myself up on the fact that my career didn't go the way it went. Um, and so, and sometimes I even took myself out of the game um, just because I was playing it safe. But um, life is too short to play it safe and life is too short to dwell on the mistakes that you made in the past. So when you find your why, go for it, dream big or go home. Um, and so with that said, um, keep pushing, keep striving, keep grinding, um, turn off the TV when you net when necessary. Um, but don't forget to take care of yourself because um, you still got to learn how to recharge your batteries. I tell my guys that as well. Um, find, make some time for you um, and get yourself refreshed and recharged. So you can hit the ground and fresh and grind the next day. Um, and that is a wrap. <laughs>